S.C. Roy, 1871-1942, did extensive work on Orions and also other uh, tribes of Central India. And Hutton called him father of Indian ethnology. Hutton was official of British government. We are going to um, discuss uh, S.C. Roy's career in certain uh, steps. First thing is that he did not have any formal training. He did graduation in English and later in law and went to Ranchi as an English teacher. And then he started practicing as a lawyer. And during that practice, he had to come to touch, come in contact with the tribal people. He had to learn about their traditions and customs and that was how he began to study the tribes. And uh, he, after he went there, he was there for He left for Ranchi in 1898 and you know, um, he settled there for the rest of his life. Um, and uh, what we know is that uh, seeing his enthusiasm and the work. His first work that was published was the Mundas and their country 1912. Roy was given a grant to study Orions uh, on the initiative of Gate, the census commissioner of 1911. And Roy finished his book on Orions, the Orions of Chota Nagpur in 1915. And his next book, The Birors, 1925. And then he again works in detail on Orions. He publishes Orion's religion and customs in 1928. And later, he works on Bhunya Sahvarisa. Wrote Hill Bhunya Sahvarisa in 1935. The Kharyas in 1937. In addition to this, he wrote 100 plus articles in English. Published in various journals. And he himself founded a journal, Man in India, in 1922. And he was the first to deliver lectures on anthropology in India. First to deliver lectures on anthropology in any Indian university. He did so at Patna University. Under the 
heading principles and methods of physical anthropology. He also helped set up anthropology department in many universities. So this in brief is his career. Uh, now we are going to uh, discuss his uh, approach. See, because he did not have formal training and uh, working on tribes and writing about them, working, writing, he had to have um, some kind of theoretical framework on writing about the tribes. So the important thing is, what is the framework that he followed? Okay. The framework he followed was that of, to begin with, classical evolutionists classical evolutionists. This is his first theoretical framework. He studied Morgan, Taylor, Fraser, Bachofen, and uh, he did the work on Orions using the framework of the classical evolutionists. Okay. Classical evolution was to was to think of various societies evolving in the same way because man's mind works in the same way wherever he is. So culture evolves in a particular way and in certain stages. And each stage has certain particular cultural traits which are universal for any culture at that stage. So Morgan tried to, sorry, Roy tried to uh, look at and study Orions in terms of those stages and cultural traits. Okay. For example, First of all, he defined culture as he used the word culture as defined by Tyler, which meant uh, a society's origins, early history, its environment, physical features, economy, social organization, village life, everything about the society. And when he classified totems of Orions, he used Fraser's classification. And when he came across Bachelor's Hall, he took it as the survival of their savagery stage. and the kinship system as classificatory, which is Morgan's classification, and religion as animism, 
which is Taylor's classification. So, with the framework provided by the classical evolutionists, he looked at the Orions. Okay. And later, as people are critical of the classical evolutionists, as many anthropologists were disillusioned or they were moving to another theoretical framework, Roy also followed the criticism. Okay. And Roy also moved to the next stage in anthropological thought that is functionalism. So he understood the criticism and moved on to the next stage called functionalism initiated by Malinowski. He said, no hard and fast line between savagery and barbarism and civilization. And cultural advance exhibits in irregular alteration of progress and retrogression, temporary halts, backward slips, sudden transformation, which he wrote in 1921. So he was rejecting the assumptions of classical evolutionism. And then he moved to um, functionalism. Functionalism. Functionalism is about doing field work using participant observation. Roy was convinced by both. And with this new perspective, he criticized Risley for his inaccurate statements being, being inevitable as data was not collected firsthand. Now, this collecting firsthand is the was not there in the classical evolutionary stage. This came later. So, uh, in fact, in his first work on Orions, um, Roy depended on official data and also he used Risley's analysis, anthropometry, and also uh, Christian missionaries work. But now Roy was looking at the authenticity of the sources. Okay. And also uh, his 1928 book on Orions uh, said a lot about um, the stories of Orions. Stories as Orions saw. As 
Roy observed. Roy interviewed. And also he wrote on how religion and magic were functional to our youngs. Again, this is functionalism. And how um, and what are the institutions among the Aryans and what functions they served and how these institutions are related. Which means uh, he is trying to follow the assumptions and methods of Malinowski's functionalism by his 1928 work. Okay. So, uh, till now, he was following um, Western anthropological thought, and studying Indian tribes in terms of the theories and the concepts given by uh, the Western anthropologists. Okay. And from this stage onwards, S. E. Roy starts thinking in his own way. Next thing, next step in his thinking is that Roy starts thinking that mm, there is something good in tribes. Something good, something good um, something which is at an early stage, early stage, this may not be new, but also something good. So, he tends to have a more sympathetic view sympathetic view of the culture. Okay. Uh, for example, he writes While he was writing that positive changes in religion took place due to contact with higher Hindu culture, in the case of Oriens, uh, there is a hint of superiority of tribal culture, saying the germ of Bhakti cult had long been present in the tribal soul, he writes. And then he said they had contained the germs of a state. And some of the things he describes are reminiscences of a glorious past. And Oryan culture was rich enough in the past, contributed not only to the racial makeup of the Bengalis, Behari Sandoria, I mean, Oriyans contributed in the past, not only to the racial makeup, but also to the social, religious and cultural equipment of these people. And the songs of Oriyan had a high poetic quality. So Roy begins to appreciate. Okay. And uh, he, it is a more sympathetic view of the uh, tribes of Central India. 
um, but this view does not go to the extent that they are good and so conserve them, conserve, isolate. He doesn't. Or conserve everything. He doesn't. Isolate, no. There is something good which means something should be protected. Respected. Okay. But uh, they should be helped in change, in social change. In anthropology, there is a big debate regarding the approaches to the tribes. Should they be isolated and be allowed to remain what they are? Or should they be assimilated? Roy was very clearly against isolation. Very clearly against assimilation. Okay. Roy did not want those to be transformed like others, to be changed like others. He had respect for them. Roy wanted the tribes to be changed and improved. Okay. And also he felt that it was the duty of the mainstream to help them. Okay. And political arrangements should be made to help. Okay. Anthropologists, administrators like Archer and Hutton propagated isolation. And Bose, Ghure and Majumdar were for intervention. They were against divide and rule policy of the British. And constitutional reforms were being discussed around 1930s. And Roy was a member of Bihar and Orissa Legislative Council. And what was his stand? He was for he was for treating aboriginals with Chota Nagpur as minorities with special rights, giving adequate representation in legislature with promotion of their cultural and economic interests. Okay. So this was his overall perspective. Minorities with special rights because at that time, the discussion was on religious minorities. S.C. Roy wanted tribes also to be treated as minorities with special rights. Okay. At that time, there was no concept of uh, reservations, no concept of either S.C. or S.T. But Roy was at that time thinking in terms of minorities with special rights.
Bihar government opposed Roy's stand on the ground that the tribes did not attain wealth, position, literacy, and political organization to be treated as minorities. Muslims could be treated as minorities because they were advanced enough, but tribes were could not argue argument is that cannot be treated as minorities because they are not advanced enough. Okay. Which means that uh, if they are not advanced enough and if they should be advanced enough means that they are being judged in terms of civilization. So that becomes a ground for assimilation. Which Roy was opposed to. In fact, Roy thought that the tribes had greater claim to their culture as well as the resources. That is why he used the word Aboriginals. Okay, Adivasis. Okay. So, towards protecting their culture and uh, economic interests, Roy wanted special laws on tenancy, money lending. This is to prevent indebtedness and land alienation. Roy was for creating employment and to promote education. And one very clear proof that suggests that he wanted tribes to change uh, in terms of moving towards civilization is his advocacy of English education. He said English education would enable the Aborigines to hold their own in the competitive struggle of the modern world. So, he wanted to empower them and he wanted the administrators there to have sympathy and they should be conversant with the language and the culture of the tribals. So I think we can see that um, Roy's thinking is, is what finally uh, approved theoretically. That is the idea of that they have the right to protect their culture, right to protect their resources, and constitutional arrangements are needed towards that end. Administrative arrangements are needed. And at the same time, they should also be helped in moving towards civilization. So you can see in Roy's stand, all the elements of what came to be accepted in Anthropology. Okay. Roy in that way um, was very successful in, in conceiving what should be the uh, strategy in dealing with the tribes. Okay. So from this onwards, he moves towards um, in a different direction. He moves in a different direction. This is an interesting turn in his career. After seeing good in them, good in them, or glory, in them. 
Roy tries to or learns to see good and glory in us in Hinduism. In particular. So he turns inwards, but this time at the mainstream values. And uh, he turns religious. He seems to have taken Advaita very seriously. Okay. And then he looks at anthropology and uh, anthropology specific to India in certain unique ways. Okay. He was no longer following the Western thought. Anthropology, he, Roy becomes a proud Indian, proud of his past with a, or advocating a unique vision a vision that can be called distinctly Indian. Or we can say even Hindu. Because what Rai was uh, proposing were essentially Hindu philosophical and spiritual ideas. Okay. Roy now is taking a holistic view of the society, the world, and man, and his relationship with the society. And what is the role of anthropology in all this? Is introspecting, questioning. being himself and trying to find what would be his unique thinking. Okay. From his understanding of philosophy, Rice knows that uh, that religion and spirituality's methods are different. Methods tends to be subject to inwards. This is whereas uh, science, anthropology was about objective, outwards, Rai felt that mm, both these methods may be needed to create science of man. And he believed these methods are coming from India and this from the West. So he felt that India has a contribution to make 
in the creation of science of man. So that is about methodology. Okay. By combining the objective and analytic methods of investigation followed by the scientists of the West, in combination with the subjective and synthetic methods emphasized by the Arya Rishis of ancient India, who too did not neglect objective and analytical methods as well, Indian anthropologists will succeed in establishing before long an Indian school of anthropology for the pursuit of the science of man, which may be expected to give fresh inspiration even to Western students of the science. Okay. So, India's methods can contribute to anthropology as developed universally. That's one. And next he takes what finally is the goal? He links Hindu goals as the goals of anthropology, moksha, anthropology goals. And Roy understands these goals, something like self, uh, or you could, he understands something like not being selfish. You can say that Roy has understood transformation involves not being selfish. Rather, uh, feeling oneness with all. Kinship with all. Okay. So, he knows that the goal of man is to move away from self-centeredness and feeling one with the world. And he thinks anthropology should enable a student of anthropology to move towards this, to move away from self-centeredness and experience sense of oneness with the world. Which means the religious goals of Hindus. Roy thinks are worth achieving. And anthropology should enable this process. All this shows how much respect Roy had for anthropology. 
the highest of man, he thought. Um, can be reached or in that reaching, anthropology can play a role. Why did he think like that? Because he took anthropology as, as a story of man from the very beginning. And uh, in a way that you can see the past in a present simple society. You can see the man's past in the present simple society. And uh, it is a study of so many societies, which means it enables a holistic picture of mankind. And this should widen man's horizon. And somehow this should enable man to see the unity. He should see himself. in an Eskimo. So this is supposed to um, contribute to move away from self-centeredness. Okay. And enable him to realize the oneness of mankind. Okay. So these things he write in 1937 and 38. He brings that spiritual content to the Goals of anthropology. The world consciousness, a student of anthropology, would then be supplemented, chastened, and elevated by a spirit consciousness, the consciousness of one eternal self in all. And the truth that anthropology brings is calculated to expand the student's soul and induce a sense of its universality and infinity. In contrast to the biological rivalry of the animal world, he will be inspired with a sense of universal kinship with man in every clime and in every level of culture. Okay. Man is supposed to experience that oneness and then what happens? He says, then there will be an end of the malady of modern civilization. It's cross egotism and rank selfishness. It's aggressive wars. It's gospel of race superiority and race hatred. It's estimation of material progress as the be all and end all of human societies. It's cult of temporal power based on brute force and on the prostitution of intellect by the invention of diverse nefarious engines of destruction. Which means he thinks that anthropology can be a discipline that is a critic of modern civilization.
this shows how the father of ethnology indian ethnology thought what purpose the ethnology should serve and then he says something specific to india the study of men of different races and religions of the customs and manners of one another may help in promoting mutual amity and eventually help to banish much of the communal animosity which is the bane of indian national life at the present day okay so he was writing it this in the context of communal disturbances hatred and he thought anthropology would should be a solution okay so this is a very higher goals for anthropology he is not thinking of anthropology as a discipline that would help the modern man that would enable modern man to help the primitive it is not like that it is not simply uh good to it is not simply useful to devise a developmental program though it is useful for that purpose also roy is thinking anthropology to be a critic of the modern civilization and uh, that can be a source to create a better society because this what he thought of anthropology the reason why students of anthropology now pay greater attention to the investigation of primitive society is that the social life of primitive tribes is the most fruitful field of anthropology for anthropology research for primitive society exhibits the ground plan on which the more complex structure that we call civilization has been built up so he knows that anthropology gives an insight and that insight the which can free man from his narrowness so these are interesting views and i found them very very fascinating because um in a way i myself thought similarly uh i thought of advaita and unique methods of indian spirituality and uh, potential of study of simple societies to contribute to the wisdom of man okay for example i wrote in the preface to first edition of anthropological thought i am aiming at some kind of marriage between the two worlds one focusing on individual phenomena having self awareness as its methodology and other focusing on social phenomena whose methodology is object to observation of the outer world it is this search search for possible linkages between the two that forms the most important source of motivation in doing this work that was the preface i was and then that was that was that my first serious work after technical call after graduation in a technical thing is anthropological thought that's how i saw it and then the second edition 
also says something similar. It says, what would a Buddhist inquire in a distant future? It is on, is it only kinship, stratification, technology, distribution of food, etc.? Maybe not. He might study the nature of conditioning, role of thought, role of ambition, etc. The topics of his study could as well be altogether different. A simple society can be used for spiritual investigation. So essentially, uh, the scope of anthropology is so vast that the highest ambition of man uh, should be given as or can be given as uh, one of the purposes of studying anthropology. Anthropology is not simply uh, a modern man's uh, condescending look at the primitive. Anthropology should be um, the source of self-introspection and critic of the present. Okay. Um, but S.C. Roy um, glorifies the past probably in, a, in ways that uh, one shouldn't. I mean, these are similar to what Gure did later. As Roy says, in ancient India, the study of the science of man did not suffer from such neglect or indifference as at the present day. History, social anthropology, and jurisprudence were represented in, in ancient Sanskrit literature by Purana, Samhitas, and Dharmasastras. There is no lack of historical sense in the others of Puranas. This comes to close, close to what would later be Gure's thinking. This is an undue glorification, which uh, need not be continued. Thank you.